He also said if Biden wants to act in the best interest of the country, he would let someone else run because the stakes of miscalculation are too dramatic to ignore. You got it. Now, we've got David uh, Barnson with us to cover the market. But before we get to that, I want your comment on this, uh, the poll and the Biden uh, in, the, in power. Et cetera, I think et a lot of people are talking as if these vulnerabilities are brand new. And I think they've been there for a while. The polling is really validating it. It's getting worse. But I've had a theory for the whole time that they wanted to avoid a food fight primary. And for Biden to say he's running, freezes everyone else, go through this whole process. Then at the end, once they feel confident that President Trump will be the nominee, then they can come in. Biden can step down. He'll have every health and age reason in the world to do so. And then a Gavin Newsom or someone steps in. Uh, David Axelrod is a very respected guy in the Democrat Party. He's a very smart guy. And I pay attention. Biden's in a lot of trouble right now. He certainly is. Really, let's get to the financial side of things. You think that investors should move on from tech fads. Are you talking about like Microsoft here? Well, I don't think that Microsoft is a tech fad. I think the largest software company in the world that is used on very, virtually every computer ever is more than a fad. I think that paying 50 times earnings for AI is a fad, that buying into new bubbles is a very dangerous idea. Some companies like Microsoft and Apple at least have a ton of earnings. You're just paying through the nose for them. But I'm referring more to a whole lot of other tech companies that don't even have earnings, don't even have the hundreds of billions of dollars of cash that Microsoft and Apple have. So I think that overall sector has gotten very frothy. Okay. Uh, stay with us, please. Yeah. Got you for the hour. It's what Jared Kushner said, right? A, a Jew is more safe in Saudi Arabia than on a college campus. What do you got to say, David? I just want to point out that Bill Ackman, major hedge funder here on Wall Street, wrote a scathing letter to Harvard over the weekend coming down on them for this. Mark Rowan, the CEO of Apollo, huge private equity group, going after Penn, really encouraging to see Wall Street holding the Ivy League to account. And so they should. Uh, David Barnson, safety in the mega caps. What's your response to that? It's not my view. The idea of a name that went down 70 percent last year, like Facebook, when interest rates started going up, that one of its selling points may be that they're getting rid of a thing that they put 30 billion dollars into. I don't agree. I understand the idea that Apple and Google have a lot of cash on the balance sheet. But these are highly expensive stocks that get hammered when you go through tough economic times. City stock doing nothing today. It's actually down this year by 6%. What's your input, Dan? You know, I was a managing director at Morgan Stanley for many years, including through the financial crisis. Morgan Stanley bought Smith Barney from yeah, Citigroup. Um, you know who used to run Smith Barney at Citigroup? Jamie Dimon, now the CEO of J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan has all these great businesses, even when banking is struggling. Citigroup got rid of all their good businesses. That's why these layoffs are there. They had to sell the Smith Barneys back during the financial crisis. This stuff is still uh, playing out. It's a hangover effect. All right. Thank you, David. Yep. Elon Musk, he just debuted an AI chatbot to take on chat GPT. Much like Elon Musk, he has a snarky bot that works closely with the social media site that used to be called Twitter. It has access to real-time data. I don't like the look on your face. Well, this is what the world needs, is more snark. <laughs> Leave it at that. Like. Yeah, Leave that's that's right. all I have to say. Here's where I want to get to Warren Buffett. They reported their earnings. The stock is down a thousand bucks, but that's just point two. Just half a million dollars to own one share of Berkshire Hathaway. So it's interesting to see it. What's like your that. verdict on the uh, on the report? Well, it's a little over a five hundred billion dollar market cap, and so they have a lot of cash. And the problem at that size is you can't move the needle. Let's say you find the greatest investment you've ever seen for ten billion dollars. It's just nothing. It's a tiny little fraction. of So the what's size. he going to do with it? So he's going to end up doing a very large acquisition if we go into a recession. Of That's what? what he's done. Yeah. Well, what's well he look, after the financial crisis, he bought the largest railroad company in North America. He loves those old industrial companies. He tripled his money on that. He did huge money into Goldman Sachs, huge money to General Electric. Recently, he Chevron. Uh, that's right. He, he's done a lot in oil and gas, which is kind of interesting. The left doesn't talk about that a lot. Buffett's a big oil and gas investor. $157 billion, and we don't know what he's going to do with it. We'll find out, I'm sure. I think it's time we had got some stock picks. And you've brought some stock picks with you, which are dividend payers, right? So start with this one, Blue Owl Capital. 
Yes, and remember, we always like dividend growers, right. and Blue Owl is in this private credit world. You have a lot of banks not lending money, and you have big Wall Street firms. Blue Owl is right down on Park Avenue here in New York that have raised billions of dollars to lend where banks won't lend. They're making a lot of money. They're a big dividend payer, and they're going to grow that dividend double digits every year for the three, four years ahead. Next one is Truist. Yeah, so Truist was one of the huge regional banks that got hit when First Republic went down. We love the story of Truist being judged as if it's a regional bank, but it's really a lot bigger. Now, the stock is up about 4 or $5 a share in the last couple of weeks. We think its worst days are behind it. And, Stuart, it's yielding 7%, and they're covering that dividend with cash flow. 7%? Yes, sir. Take it. Verizon. And Verizon's another story that, again, huge CapEx. The stock was down around $31 two weeks ago. You see here it's up to 36 Had the best quarter last week that they've announced in a couple of years. Definitely, we think their huge expense of 5G is beyond is past them. And now they have a lot of profits to bring in ahead. Still need to execute well, but Verizon, we think its worst days are behind it. Last week, you told me about a mall operator that was really well-placed. They were paying like 7 or 8%. I've forgotten the name of it. Simon Property Simon Group, Property. SPG, 272 malls, definitely one of the finest real estate companies in the country. And it pays 7%? Uh, 7.5%. Woohoo. Okay, I'll yes. take that. Thank you, David. Yes, sir. Some candidates for the Republican presidential nomination have gone to visit with Zelensky in Ukraine. You look like you're primed for a comment. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's helpful for us to say things can be done in one day. Right. They clearly are more complicated than that. No matter how anyone feels about this issue, it's complicated. And I think that people can have different opinions as to how we should or shouldn't be supporting Ukraine. But this idea that I can just build a wall and get Mexico to pay for it, I'm going to fix Ukraine in one day, I wish we'd sort of talk more realistically. But right. Putin gotcha. might not have invaded Ukraine if Trump were president. Well, that's oh, a, it, it can't be proven that's... either way. Not a lot of this bad stuff would not have happened well, that's true. if Trump was still the president of the United States. I think that's a fact. I do want to take a moment here to thank David for being with us for the hour. Much obliged to you. It's hard work and you seem to love it. Okay. Yes.